was an honor again this year for Sandy and me to be the judges of the Book Festival's writing contest. Over the years, we've seen the pieces of writing grow ever more personal and more engaging. This year's prompt was inspired by our visiting author, Kwame Alexander, and his books like The Crossover and Rebound. The prompt was, describe a topic, idea, or concept you find so engaging that it makes you lose all track of time. Why does it captivate you? We got essays and poems, both, in response. It's never easy to make these decisions. There's so many good pieces, all deserving recognition. But here are this year's winners. And Joseph Constanza would be standing next to me, but he's at his graduation. Our fourth finalist this year is believed by Joseph Constanza at his graduation. Written in the rhythmic flowing style he describes as spoken word poetry, Joseph has created a personal statement of commitment and courage, chronicling his choice to put behind the negativity and put downs. If Joseph were here, he would read his poetry in the right style. I will do my best. Here's one quote that leave me beaten, battered, broken, battling biggest bombings of confidence, but I'm proud how I've overcame when I was down so afraid, didn't doubt and go away. Joseph does this not just for himself. I do this for the ones that feel poor and weak like their core is beat with your tons of power. Don't be quitting for a minute, keep infecting. With your differences, don't be fitting in and let the love devour. Congratulations to Joseph. <laughs> Our third finalist is Butch by Sarah Swenson, also a senior at graduation. Sarah's, <laughs> Sarah's essay begins with an exposition of the word butch set forth in passages like this. Butch means choosing to exist in a visibly queer way. It means transformation without the goal of passing. Butch is not a shy mimicry of manhood. It is as separate from manness as it is from womanness, a fact that makes its overlap with the non-binary identity understandable. Her essay then takes a breathtaking pivot to the personal. Demystifying Butch opens something inside of me, more like cracking a watermelon than unlocking a door. Sarah's pivot introduces a cowboy, a way of being, quote, he has straight hips and a flat chest, and tomorrow he will mount a horse and ride off across the fields, and the world will care more about what he can do than who he is. Congratulations to Sarah on this extraordinary lesson on the possibilities of self-definition. Now we get to call up Goshi Gonzalez, a junior, who is not a graduation. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. He's, um, he's standing on a stool. Now he's just as tall as me. I'm vertically <laughs> challenged. <laughs> but he's not writer challenged. He's a, he's a, he's a uh, giant of writing. Our second finalist is Since You've Been Gone by Junior Goshi Gonzalez. This touching poem about the loss of a grandpa begins with the memorable lines... <laughs> Since you've been gone, I've fallen down a ra rabbit hole. Like Salvador Dali, the clocks melt and distort until I'm well past done. A wonderland of endless information. Goshi's lines speak to our hearts. But the closure I felt when I saw you one last time will last me a lifetime. I know you can't hear me, but I love you forever. And maybe we'll meet again when time takes his final cruel fell at the pearly gates of a lovely hell. The poem is also an expression of deep gratitude. You were, and always will be, the best grandpa that a little imp like me could ask for. Congratulations, Goshi, on this wonderful piece of love and memory set to verse. Do I speak now? <laughs> okay, I'm not good at this, so bear with me. Um, I wrote this poem. Uh, obviously in memory of my grandfather who passed in September, who was more of a father to me than a grandfather. He was a grandfather, if you have to put it that way. Um, 
He is the reason why I am so interested in old things and why I want to become a mortician. Um, the art of bringing final peace to many families' lives is something that I've experienced firsthand now and I would like to spread amongst anyone I can. Um, there's no words for how honorable it will be when I get that certificate. Um, and I'm very thankful to Mary Haft, Jim, my teachers, the librarians, my mom, Shannon and Hannah for being here and for making me do this against my will. Love you guys. <laughs>
I take a leaf off a tree and see intricacy in those green veins, the curved stem, life coursing through everything, the ever-loving heartbeat of the world. I look at the mouths of all my friends blooming with love. I find myself in my parents' car in the nighttime, and when I look over my shoulder, the moon is always following us. When a bowl shatters on the floor, I don't wish I had been more careful. I admire the way it glitters and hurry to find the dustpan. I cry in a quiet room and I tell my mother that I love her and that I fill the dishwasher with day-old dishes. I sharpen pencils and listen to songs and pluck minutes out of the air with my fingertips. I spend minutes now just in love with the world. I see all of this life outside the window pane. I see all of this life in the mirror before me, spinning with every glorious moment around and around, and life is ripe and mine for the picking. Um, the first thing to say about this is that my mom told me not to lie to you guys that I do the dishwasher. <laughs> Um, but I read this poem because I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about time, and I realized that that's really ironic because you waste time by thinking about wasting time. <laughs> um, but I'm nearing the end of high school, which I think naturally makes you kind of think about things. Um, and it's just kind of really scary, but um, one of my now philosophies is that you can never waste time if you don't call it a waste of time. Um, and nothing is a waste of time if you care about it. Um, sometimes living in the moment means forgetting that it's only going to be a moment, is my last thing. And I want to thank all of you guys for being here today and everybody for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to Mary and to our fabulous student uh, essay winners and poetry winners. All right. Literacy has always been an act of resistance. Reading and writing are lifelong skills that once learned cannot easily be stripped away. And freedom of speech is more than an American ideal. The quest to seek information and ideas is a universal human right. As access to books are increasingly challenged or banned in schools and public libraries across the country, gathering together to uplift books is a powerful act. And so we asked our featured authors tonight to speak from their different ideas, their different perspectives on the idea of freedom. Our first speaker tonight is Luke Russert. Luke is an author and an Emmy Award-winning journalist who served as an NBC News correspondent from 2008 to 2016. In addition to his NBC News post, Luke co-hosted the critically acclaimed 6020 Sports on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. After leaving media, Russert embarked on a three-year, six-continent travel expedition that took him to nearly 70 countries. You may have read about that in his first book, Look For Me There, uh, a New York Times bestseller. And it's a reflection of his deeply personal internal journey across many different diverse external places. Please join me in welcoming Luke Russert. Good evening, everybody. Uh, let's give a round of applause for those kids one more time. That was fantastic. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Really well done, seriously. Um, Thank you, Mary. Mary, we thank Theron. <laughs> and uh, everyone who's working so hard to put on such a wonderful, beautiful festival. And I wanna say thank you to Amani and Jody and Sebastian. I uh, now know what it li it's like to uh, open up for the Beatles. So, <laughs> it's an honor. Um, freedom, freedom. I heard that word a lot as a journalist covering American politics, and I think we all know each party has their own interpretation of what freedom is. But I think at that word and I go, is there a word that is more intertwined with the American existence? It's what this grand experiment, this liberal democracy is predicated upon, 
those certain inalienable rights endowed by our creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet who is free to exercise those rights? For our history tells us they have not been universal. That decision is made by us, but oftentimes the us excludes the all. I recently saw an interview with the inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, she gave it on CNN. The topic was her poem, The Hill We Climb, being banned in Florida. And while I'm often awed by her words, this time I did not hear them. I tuned out as I honed in on a sticker that she had affixed to the bookcase that was the backdrop of the TV shop. It read, Freedom, F-R-E-A-D-O-M. The universe must have known I had this assignment for this speech, right? Freedom. It always has and always will be the most prevalent in the written word because that's when it is, when it is read, it is transferred into our psyche, into our being. This is inconvenient, especially for those who want to exert control, and that's why written freedom can be so scary. That's why books are banned or burned. They have the power to unleash fear, fear of change, a fear of the unknown, fear of the discomfort, a fear of being offensive, a fear of the truth. Someone will always fear a book. It has been going on for our country's entire history. I would argue it's been going on for the history of the world. And we must not forget that it was not long ago that Catcher in the Rye was too sexual and too profane, that we feared Holden Caulfield explaining his freedom to make personal choices would make all the kids go wrong in America. And then Huckleberry Finn in To Kill a Mockingbird, the fear of explaining sins from the past, that they might be present in some of our country's greatest works, leads to some not being free to learn about them in school. And while topical, the discussion of literary freedom is infinite. It's forever intertwined in our politics and the American experience. So yes, as an author, I believe in freedom, as Ms. Gorman stated it. But I must say that we should be vigilant, but this fight, it is a forever one. It was fought yesterday, it is fought today, and it will be fought tomorrow. So keep your ears up and your eyes open. <laughs> but as we continue the fight, I want to take a moment to talk about my travels. I went all around the world. I was very fortunate enough to have the experience. And there's a line that is so cliche. And that is, in America, uh, sometimes we take our freedoms for granted. But that cliche is very true. When I was with kids in Cuba, and I got to know one of them and they told me stories about how they worked in the tourist hotel which had Wi-Fi, so one of them would act as a lookout, the other one would then put a USB drive into the TV and they would download NBA basketball games illegally and then watch them in their basement so they could have their own American sports bar without anyone seeing. Their own little way of freedom. Or the young woman in China who saw me frustrated trying to work my phone and goes, you know, they ban Gmail and Instagram here. You really need a VPN to access those sites and show me how to do it. Or the driver in Turkey who kept his mouth shut when I asked him about the coup that had occurred the year later and then acknowledged that people are still being rounded up for suspicious behavior. Or the migrant workers in Qatar that when I asked them if they liked being in Qatar, they gave me a wry smile and looked sideways and then said nothing. Or the women in Russia who said to me, you know, we all thought we would be free after the collapse of communism, but the freedom, uh, is, even more, freedom is even more extinguished with the corruption that has been brought upon us. So I think of those stories and I go, the world really has a complex relationship with freedom. It is not just us here. And there's a fundamental truth, right? Freedom in culture, in governance, in community, that's a forever fight. Again, it's never fully in our control. It may be temporarily, but the worst impulses of our brothers and sisters, unfortunately, sometimes is to stifle that freedom. Again, vigilance at home and abroad is needed. So I asked the question, where can we be forever free? I'd argue, that is only within ourselves, in our hearts, and in our mind. I lost my father, Tim Russert, 
uh, about 15 years ago this week. I was 22 years old. Many call him larger than life, which is pretty fitting because almost right now, 15 years now after his passing, his memory is still very much alive. But on that day, when he left in an instant, my guiding light, my North Star was gone. My best friend, the one whose acknowledgement and validation I sought that I had lived for was gone. I did not know if I would ever be free of pain and anguish again, but I didn't care to find out. Like many men, many young men, I stored and ignored. I threw myself into hard work, much of it to live up to his legacy, in the same field and marched on. Sure, it was a free choice, but was it? The weight and expectation of duty didn't really feel optional. Many of us balance that weight between duty and desire. The world throws so many things at us to stifle freedom that we might not even notice. Years later, I came to realize that I didn't know who I was independent of my late father, of my mother, my family, or the Washington bubble I grew up in. But I did know, thankfully, fortunately, I was free to find out if I could handle it. So I did. That is why I traveled. And in each country, in each culture, and in each delicious bit of obscure food that I consumed, I felt a little bit more free to figure out who I was. And it was on that journey, through thousands of miles of six continents and almost 70 different countries, that I learned something. The only way to be free, like the condor birds that I so admired in the Andes of Patagonia, or the surfers of Tahiti, was to tell Dad that I was me, a traveling man, comfortable in uncertainty, in risk, not bound by duty or need of safety and security. And then I had to do something else, sit in the grief and pain of loss and decide it would not consume me, it would not define me. When I made these choices, things became more clear. I realized two simple yet extraordinary things. My father loved me so much. The last thing he'd ever want me to do is be trapped by agony and sorrow. He'd want me to smile at his memory, not cry, and be thankful for the time we'd had together and know that we'd meet again. Secondly, if being my own person meant I wasn't just like him, maybe even more like mom, and that brought me joy, then yes, I was free and encouraged to do that. It took me years to understand this, but I am so better off for it. I am free to be me and vulnerable enough to get there. So I say to you tonight, it doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, how old you are, who you worship, who you love, but look inside. See where you can be just a little bit more free. Free to love, free to help, free to care, free to grow, free to unite, free from the baggage or pain that you may have been carrying from your past. But most of all, free to be vulnerable. Because if you can do that, then I believe you'll be totally free, or you'll at least feel like it. <laughs> Thank you so much for this honor. It really is incredible. Good night. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to hear from our next author, Imani Perry. Um, Amani is, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Fabulous. And uh, the professor, uh, Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and a faculty associate with Gender and Sexuality Studies and Jazz Studies. And this summer, she'll join the faculty of Harvard University. Um, Amani Perry is a contributing writer for The Atlantic and the author of seven books, most recently South to America a journey below the Mason-Dixon to understand the soul of a nation, which received the 2000, 2000, sorry, 2022 National Book Award for Nonfiction was an, an instant New York Times bestseller. 
South to America was also named one of President Obama's favorite books of 2022 and was on numerous best of lists of the year. Please join me in welcoming Imani Perry. It's so delightful um, to be with you this evening. I'm going to go a little bit off script. I feel um, a spirit of a sort moving in this room. It's not incidental that thus far we've heard from people who have talked about um, ancestral presences, people we love who have departed. And I think that's uh, at the, and for me it's, it re it's resonant in large part because at the center of everything I write is my late grandmother, Nita Garner Perry. But it's also that the context of, the, of our living and our loves is how we conceive of freedom. And I suppose because I am of a tradition, uh, a black woman who is descended from colonial slavery in Maryland and Virginia, uh, a person for whom unfreedom is understood as an original condition on these shores, um, that it, can, it shapes what I mean by the term, right? The deepest wound of unfreedom is the cost that unfreedom produces for those who love. I think of freedom first and foremost as a condition of being able to be with those who you love, to have bonds of family, friendship, and affection both protected and respected, to care for one's children and elders unimpeded. One of the first things that happened immediately upon emancipation is that the formerly enslaved looked for family, they advertised in newspapers and took to the road trying to find each other. There's a beautiful book titled Help Me to Find My People about the subject. Um, the idea of freedom is actually not being unfettered but being able to be bound to others. And we see that phenomenon resonant now when people are actually having their bonds of affection and commitment challenged, whether it's how they care for their children or whether their partnerships will be recognized or whether their families will be fully acknowledged. And so the original sin, as it were, um, is something that we still have to contend with. Um, I also think of freedom in terms of civic participation. Having a voice in the way one's community and society function without fear of punishment, violence, hunger, reprisal, or retribution, even when you have words of criticism for the powerful or the popular. So when I wrote about miners in West Virginia who insisted that the work that they did should be valued accordingly and at times suffered the most violent of fates in retaliation, that was an act of freedom fighting. When sharecroppers in Mississippi registered to vote and were beaten, bloody, and sometimes murdered, that was an act of freedom. Acting free, and we've heard this from both Mary and Luke in distinct ways, is essential to getting to freedom. Right? Freedom ain't free, as Mary told us, as it were. Um, and I think finally, um, I think it's important to register freedom as an internal matter of trusting one's own imagination. For those of us in this room, many of us who are writers, such extraordinary writers with us today, I'm so delighted to be with so many of them. We invite others to travel inside our hearts and minds to meet us in the inside part. 
And sometimes that that requires of us that we and they both free ourselves of some of our most intimate fears or anxieties or prejudices or bigotries or terrors even. I was thinking today that there was something quite resonant for me about um, being here to talk about freedom. Um, when you write, when you read about the history of um, U.S. slavery, much of what we talk about is the Middle Passage and this sort of harrowing trip, months-long trip that often from the coast of West Africa to the Caribbean and. Um, and to the colonies and eventually to the states and, um, and being in the hold of ships and the sort of horrific conditions. But recently I've been writing about different relationship to the water. Uh, and Nantucket is part of the story that I've been writing about those who found themselves under conditions of, if not um, captivity, um, but in containment and limitation, who went, who sought, who went on to the water again, seeking a different fortune. And I guess that is another way, seafaring is another way um, that we can think of the desire for freedom, but I think we can also think about it metaphorically, that we enter into these extraordinary journeys and we step into faith with the hopes that not only we free ourselves, but that we are perhaps in taking that journey have the opportunity to free another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imani. That was fabulous. Our next, we're going to hear from Sebastian Younger. Sebastian is a New York Times bestselling author of Tribe, War, A Death in Belmont, Fire, and The Perfect Storm. Um, he was also nominated for Academy Award. He's the winner of a Peabody Award and the National Magazine Award for Reporting. His most recent book, Freedom, maybe that inspired something we're talking about tonight, um, is, is, explores the quest for two cherished ideals, community and freedom. The two don't coexist easily. And anyway, we'll hear a little bit more about that. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sebastian Younger. Hi there. It's a pleasure to be before you tonight. Thank you. And such an important topic and such a short amount of time and such a vague topic. How am I going to, how are we going to remain coherent and, um, say something true. I'll start with this. I have, uh, I'm fortunate, blessed to have two young children. I'm 61, so I came to it late um, and gratefully. And when my um, older daughter was maybe four or five, something like that, we were sitting on a screened in porch in the spring and there was a little bird warbling away in a tree nearby. And I tried to imit I tried to communicate with it by whistling back, like imitating its song. And my daughter, whose name is Aisha, looked at me and, and said, Daddy, don't. The birds are going to think that the, there's a bird trapped in the porch that's not free. In other words, the idea of freedom is universally understood, even in very young children. It's one of the few things that people will die for, die to defend. Um, that and their families, and to make sure that their families are free. And that's been true for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the word freedom comes from archaic German, Vridom, which means beloved. Sounds lovely, except it's not. The reason for that origin is that back in the day when there's no international law, um, freedom was only accorded to people who were beloved by you, people of your heritage, people of your society, your race, your tribe. Everyone else outside of that could be slaughtered at will if you could get away with it. In other words, the original freedom, and this is in human, 
historical human terms, prehistorical human terms, the original freedom comes from being able to protect yourself and your people. And if you can't, you're not going to remain free for long. Um, if you don't believe me, ask the, Ukra the Ukrainians right now. They're fighting for freedom. They're dying for freedom. Um, if they fail in this task, they will not be free. They know it. We know it. Um, luckily, people who are fighting for freedom are better fighters than people who are fighting to oppress others. Luckily, it works that way, and we have hope for them. Uh, the other form of uh, freedom, of course, is just leadership. Leaders who do not oppress, do not abuse, do not exploit their position for power. Uh, my father was a refugee from two wars. His father was Jewish. He was, uh, my dad was born in Dresden in 33. They left Germany for obvious reasons. They went to Spain. In 36, when my dad was 13, they fled Spain when the fascists came in under Franco. They went to France. 1940, they came to the United States. Um, luckily, fascism is not a very stable form of government, luckily. Um, as Thomas Masaryk, the great Czech statesman, said in the 1930s, watching the rise to fascism throughout Europe, he said, dictators look great until the last five minutes. Not, not one communist or fascist regime in Europe has survived since World War II. They've all crumbled. Democracies, on the other hand, do quite well, and I'll address that in a moment. Um, so the advent of agriculture that was a great blessing for the human race also allowed the accumulation, accumulation of wealth, the accumulation of armies. People were rooted in one spot because they were tillers of the land. They couldn't just, if they had an abusive leader, they couldn't just pull up their tent stakes and leave the way mobile societies can. Um, and that was the first opportunity for abusive leaders to impose their will on great numbers of people alongside these states, which started around eight, 9,000 years ago. Alongside these states were the traditional mobile human societies. Um, we all know some of their names, the Mongols, the Apache, the Scythians, in, innumerable free people that roamed the earth and were exceptionally egalitarian because you can't accumulate much wealth if you're mobile. These societies also relied on a profound sense of civic duty and, a, and individual courage to maintain their freedom. Um, during the so-called Apache Wars in the American Southwest in the 1870s, 1880s, there was an expression, there is nothing so dangerous as a wounded Apache. Because what that man would do is put up a last stand and hold back the US cavalry so that his, the rest of his people could escape into the mountains. Um, on another continent, another era, Emperor Darius set forth to conquer the Scythians, who were this untamable, wild people. They rode horses, they had long hair, they smoked marijuana, right? They were um, an outlandish people and un, uh, untamable. And he set forth with the greatest army on earth to defeat them. And he chased them around because they're mobile. They ch he chased them around for weeks. And finally they said, okay, we'll, we'll confront you. And they, they wheeled and confronted him. And across the field of battle, the two great army, armies faced each other. The Scythians were gonna get slaughtered, right? They didn't have a chance. This was the greatest army on earth. And the soldiers, the fighters, looked at each other across the battlefield and Darius noticed something insane. That the Scythian warriors facing annihilation where they're spending their last minutes waiting for the battle to begin, were spending their last minutes hunting rabbits in the underbrush. And he thought, if you fight people that are that courageous, it will cost you too much. It's not worth it. And he turned and left with his great army. Um, democracy is quite good at both defending itself and guarding against abusive leadership. Um, the idea of individual rights, obviously um, imperfectly applied, and our society has great flaws we all, that we all know about. Um, the fact that we discuss those flaws suggests that we actually are a society that is striving for freedom. But that combination of being able to defend ourselves and having, at least in theory, the ideal 
of just leadership and individual rights uh, means that we, that we have a very, very free society compared to many countries in the world. One of the advantages of, of democracy is that it tends to be affluent, right? That affluence comes with the downside. We don't need each other individually. We are such a wealthy society that the daily tasks of survival that have beset the human race for hundreds of thousands of years, we are actually spared all that. Um, and because we don't need each other, we have this last vulnerability. When your freedom, freedoms are largely protected by society, the, the ultimate threat to your freedom is internal, comes from you. Um, we, are, we are vulnerable to the tyranny of the self, the tyranny of self-interest. Um, our society doesn't need us, so we are allowed to think about ourselves in unrestrained ways, and that itself can lead to a kind of um, uh, servitude. Uh, we are addicted to our phones, to many, many substances. We are addicted to spending, to personal debt. We are addicted to distraction, to screens. Uh, there is a way out, and the way out the ultimate freedom, in my opinion, in a society like ours, where we are blessed for institutional freedom, the way out, if you are finding yourself in that kind of servitude to your addictions, uh, to your self-interest, of course we are, why wouldn't we be? We are interesting to ourselves, right? If you find yourself in that situation, thinking about putting others first is an amazing path towards freedom. And I'll end with this story. I know I've gone over my seven minutes, but I'll end quickly with this story. Several, about 10 years ago, I was, I, I was leaving a hotel in Virginia early in the morning and there was a, a nice looking gentleman in the 70s in a wheelchair missing half of his right leg and it was swathed, swaddled in bandages. Whatever had happened to him had just happened. And he was trying to get into a locked car. He was trying to get into the passenger seat of a car and he couldn't get in. And I went over to him, I said, sir, can I help you? And he said, no, it's okay, my wife's coming. She, she has the keys, I'm all right. And I looked and, and I said, this, this seems like it's really, really hard, hard thing for you. And he said, well, no self-pity, right? He said, well, it's interesting. I was like, all right, you're a tougher nut than I thought. I'll try again. And I said, you seem really brave about it. And he scowled. He looked at me like I was the biggest fool that he'd met all week. And he said, brave about it. There's young people in this country missing both their legs from those wars. Don't tell me that I'm brave. He was thinking about other people and his freedom lay in that. That made him a free man. Um, if we one day will have leaders like that, we will be a free country. Thank you. So much. The last reader, our last writer, we'll hear from tonight is Jody Piku. Jody is the number one New York Times best-selling author of 28 novels. I will not list them all right now, uh, but I will tell you a few of them that I'm sure you've also read: "Wish You Were Here," "Small Great Things," "Leaving Time," and "My Sister's Keeper." Um, her books have been translated into 34 languages in 35 countries. She's written two young adult novels, Between the Lines and Off the Page, co-written with her daughter, and they've been adapted and developed by the authors into a musical entitled Between the Lines. So please join me in welcoming Jody Pico. Hello, I am batting cleanup. Um, I am here to tell you about a freedom that you are all about to lose. I was watching a book being burned the seventh time I learned that one of my novels was being banned in the US. I was in rehearsals for a musical called The Book Thief, of which I had written the libretto. It's a beautiful novel by Marcus Zusak that I'm sure many of you know. And it's about the rise of fascism and anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany. A prop book was set on fire every night because the director thought it was shocking and powerful. 
and a notice popped up on my computer screen. My book, 19 Minutes, had been banned, and whoosh, a Nazi lit a book on fire. It was very on the nose. In the past year, my book, 19 Minutes, has been banned more than dozens of times. I was almost getting used to receiving emails from PEN America, which tracks books that are banned, but then something happened this fall that actually did shock me. In Martin County School District in Florida, 92 books were pulled at the request of a single parent. 20 of those 92 were mine. The reason given? My books were porn. Spoiler alert, I don't write porn, okay? <laughs> Many of my books don't even have a kiss in them. What my books do have are issues like racism, gun control, abortion rights, gay rights, and others that encourage kids to think for themselves. Gender queer, the bluest eye, all boys aren't blue, the handmaid's tale, flamer, milk and honey. These books are the most banned books in the United States right now. 19 Minutes, which is my novel about a school shooting, has been banned in over 23 school districts as of today. Now, nobody thinks that all books are appropriate for all ages, and nobody wants porn on a bookshelf. In the past, teachers and media specialists used professional training to figure out what was age appropriate, and they listened to parents and students and teachers. Now, Florida has a very broadly worded law that limits what books can and cannot be in schools. Teachers and media specialists in Florida have been told to err on the side of caution and to remove books they wouldn't feel comfortable reading aloud. They face being charged with a third degree felony, losing their teaching license, and having a $5,000 fine. Here is the process for getting a book banned in Martin County, Florida. The challenger does not have to read the material or give a reason that it's inappropriate. That's right, that's exactly what I said. Let's talk for a minute about who's banning these books. Moms for Liberty is a national group that is on a mission to ban material in school libraries. The majority of books that are being banned are written by BIPOC and LGBTQ authors. Others are called out as having sexual content, being mature, or they're just called porn, like mine were. In Florida, and in many other states, they have the growing support of legislation on their side. But it's not just Florida and Texas. Bans in 2022 occurred in 37 states, in 182 school districts, and have affected millions of students. They have increased 1,100% since 2020. The number of titles being banned has gone from 200 to over 2,500. And get this. 11 individuals are responsible for 60% of all school bans in this country. 11 individuals. The people who are banning books know that the process for reviewing challenged books is usually really chaotic and really disorganized. The books cannot go back on a shelf until they're reviewed. If there's no set process for review, they don't care because the book is still out of circulation and that's all that they want. Now look, I'm a mom. I used to read books before my kids did to make sure that I thought that they were emotionally ready and then we would use those books as springboards for discussion. There is nothing wrong with a parent deciding a certain book is not right for her child. There is something seriously wrong with that parent deciding that book is not right for any child. These parents will tell you that the books expose kids to topics that are salacious and revolutionary. As the author George M. Johnson says, these books do not expose kids to difficult issues. They give them the resources to manage the issues that they're living with daily. What kids are really being exposed to? Lives and mindsets different from their own, which creates compassion and empathy. We know that kids who feel marginalized, that see themselves in a book, feel less alone. We know that kids who have never encountered someone different from themselves get to do so in the safe space of a book. Books bridge divides between people and book bans create them. Now these parents will tell you, I'm only trying to protect a child's innocence. Well, you can childproof the world, but you cannot worldproof a child. Taking a book off a shelf and preventing a kid from reading it does not allow you to erase history 
whether that's the Holocaust or enslavement or discrimination against LGBTQ people or any other part of America's past that we might not be proud of. Why should you care? This may not be happening here in Nantucket yet. That doesn't mean it will not. Banning books is a very slippery slope. We've already seen school plays being canceled because someone decides that they're problematic. We have seen challenges to curriculum by people who do not have degrees in education. We have seen major distributors like Target remove their pride displays because of a small number of critics. We've seen a Tony-winning play on Broadway about anti-Semitism being picketed by white supremacists. Ignoring book bans emboldens those who want to restrict the freedom to read, the freedom to think, and the freedom to live life authentically. Okay, so what's the good news? Well, we can change this. This week, just this week, Illinois passed a law to ban book bans. Yes. Yes, let's go to church, people, okay. <laughs> Far more people in America want to prevent book bans than to create them. The problem is that we are catering to a minority that is very loud. We know, ladies, that it is a lot easier to protect rights that are threatened than it is to restore them when they're taken away, right? Okay. So, what are we gonna do? Well, the first thing that you all need to do when someone tells you that book bans are a hoax, tell them otherwise. As long as books remain off a shelf, under review, they are banned. Even if it's temporary, it's a ban. Even if you can get them on Amazon, it's a ban. School libraries exist because for some kids, that is the only way that they can access or afford books. That is why school bans are bans. The other thing that you can do is run for your school board. Moms for Liberty picked up over 500 school board seats last year alone. Right, scary number, right? You can use your social media to spread news about book bans. You can go to pen.org slash action to find out what steps you can take, and you can donate so that they can continue their fight against book bans. All of you are here because you're readers start a banned book club. And in fact, I would like to challenge the leadership of the Nantucket Book Festival to only invite banned authors next year. <laughs> Above all else, speak out. We need people who support the freedom to read to be just as loud as the people who do not. We know from history that the way that you control a nation is by controlling what its citizens read. We also know from history what the next chapter looks like when we don't fight book bans, and that story does not end well. Books give us knowledge, they give us comfort, they give us coping strategies for the world we live in, and they give us dreams of a better world that we can create. And I don't know about you, but I am not letting people take those gifts away from me without a fight. I hope you have a fantastic festival week.